ladies and gentlemen, can you put your hands together for Maxine Ledrock? Hello, Defcon. How are you doing? Nice. I just, uh, I had a party near my room all the night, so I slept like 45 minutes. So <laughs> I'm sorry if my brain will switch off at some point of this presentation, but hope we will manage to do it. So uh, we are going to talk about um, zero bucks found, hold my beer AFL, uh, how to improve coverage guided fuzzing and find new zero days in tough targets. So glad to see all of you here. Uh, first of all, let me thank Defcon Goons for having me here. I'm really excited to speak uh, at this stage today. Uh, before we actually start, uh, let me introduce myself. So my name is Max. I have spoken at various uh, security conferences around the planet, mostly about dynamic analysis of machine code. And last year, I presented at DevCon a talk about malware fuzzing. So check it out if you're interested in this topic. I have experience working on open source fuzzers such as WinFL, DRFL, uh, contributing in open source framework uh, DynamoRio, and working on implement implementing extremely abstract uh, operating system uh, for Windows malware analysis at IBM Research in Israel. So currently I am working at Salesforce uh, Red Team as an offensive researcher, uh, searching for zero day bugs, uh, writing exploits and doing engagements. In my case, uh, I need to identify vulnerability and write exploit uh, in a very, very short uh, period of time. And that's actually where, where our story about efficient uh, coverage guided fuzzing begins. So we are going to talk about fuzzing today, right? And what kind of problems we, we, we face uh, when we use AFL. Uh, I will describe what coverage guided fuzzing is and explain how AFL actually work. Then we're going to talk about downsides of AFL and how each of them can ruin your entire fuzzing campaign. And in the second part of my talk, uh, I'll present a new coverage guided fuzzer implemented uh, in pure Python that's uh, supposed to address all of these problems. And of course, we will compare it with FL. I will show you a couple of uh, vulnerabilities I managed to find with this fuzzer. And so, what is fuzzing? And more importantly, what is coverage guided fuzzing? So the general idea uh, of fuzzing is actually a dream of any professional procrastinator. Right. So you run a special tool. Uh, this tool mutate your input, provide this input uh, into your target, and you just see it, wait for your crash. That's basically all. Let's see it on example. Uh, let's say we have a very trivial program that crash on input uh, power on it. Uh, we start string uh, five phase. Uh, we, we cover first couple of lines, program exits, we do it again and again until we find something that can uh, cause a crash in the target. Uh, in this example, our fuzzer need to mutate uh, the string from five A's uh, to pound it. And this is very unlikely and can take hours or even days uh, to finally find this uh, null pointer the reference. So to be able to address this problem, people invented uh, coverage guided fuzzing. Uh, people call, also call it uh, feedback driven or smart fuzzing. Uh, in this case, we continue mutating uh, our input, but at the same time, we estimate coverage uh, triggered in our target. So if we see that our input lead to some new path in the target, we save this input and then perform a subsequent mutation on top of this uh, input. We do it again and again, we apply the same algorithm for the next finding, we save it, we mutate the next byte, search for potential new path opened by this mutation, then save it again, uh, mutate the next byte, uh, until we finally find uh, an input uh, that can trigger uh, a crash in our target. So this way we can cover the program in depth and actually it dramatically increase uh, efficiency of your fuzzing campaign. So instead of spending uh, hours or even days uh, doing blind fuzzing, uh, you would be able to find this null pointer the reference just in a couple of seconds. So you see the difference. And this algorithm is the basis of the most known uh, today coverage guided fuzzer called American Fuzzer Lob or AFL. 
So FL was created by Michal Zalewski five years ago and today it's a standard de facto coverage guided Pfizer uh, for box hunting. Uh, it's attracting people with its efficiency and successful stories of critical vulnerabilities found with it and it's a very powerful uh, solution for vulnerability research uh, especially if you have a uh, source code of your target. So I have prepared a short uh, visualization of how FL actually works. So here on the screen we have four windows. Uh, in the left upper window we can see FL status screen. It's just regular FL status screen. In the right screen we see number of uh, files already exist in our queue. So as soon we, we, as we continue mutating uh, we uh, increase in our files uh, number of our files in, in the queue. Um, so in the left uh, middle uh, window we can see uh, content of file of actual file that we are going to provide in our uh, application and it's in hex and I am in, I'm indicating with red uh, the actual change that FL uh, performing on our input. Uh, so you can see it performed a lot of uh, random mutations in our file and as soon as we continue mutating uh, this input uh, the number of path is growing. You can see it on the plot on the top uh, on the bottom left uh, plot uh, with white background. So you can see it's growing and in, in this example uh, we uh, we do fuzzing against 7 zip. It's just uh, let's stop this video and move forward. So for the past five years FL proved itself to be a very efficient fuzzer to find memory corruption bugs in many different uh, projects on many different platforms both uh, in user land and in the kernel of all widely spread platforms. Uh, there is even kernel version of FL called KFL. Uh, I managed to find a couple of bugs with this uh, tool uh, but this is different story. People even search for bugs in very specific places like SCADA system, switches, wireless hardware, medical devices, where any problem with software quality uh, security can cause serious consequences or human lives. So while many, many of you might think like ok Max, uh, memory corruption bugs are cool but we are running in the cloud, uh, right? While this is true, uh, C and C++ remains to be on the top of the most used programming languages. So our world is running on top of C or C++ fortunately or unfortunately. Uh, we can also look into statistics on number of research publications about fuzzing year by year and we can definitely see the trend. So it's growing and last year it exceeded 1500 publications. Uh, it's a very hot research topic today. A lot of people play uh, with fuzzing and a lot of companies invest in this technology. Uh, Google even has an OSS fuzz project where they integrated uh, fuzzing within uh, software development life cycle of 170, 60 open source projects. Uh, they use a lot of uh, CPU power and they already identified a uh, thousand memory corruption issues uh, by generating half trillion test cases per week. So this high popularity of fuzzing across security community means uh, that it's becoming harder and harder to find new bugs in products and libraries already covered by security researchers or projects like OSS FAT, right? So we have to search for some new strategy and be able to perform fuzzing more efficiently than other uh, tools and to be able to perform fuzzing more efficiently uh, we have to understand what kind of issues already exist in modern fuzzers and be able to address them. So let's start with the first one and it's a volatile path. Uh, what is volatile path? Uh, let's say we have input uh, eight A's that cover these three branches in our target in indicated by green. Uh, we mutate one bit and now it covers uh, three previous branches and two more shown in yellow. Let, so if we, uh, just a second. Okay. So if we send this input again in the target, uh, it again cover only the first three paths. So we, we send absolutely the same uh, input in our target but uh, now it doesn't cover a uh, path indicated by yellow. And those paths are uh, considered to be volatile. They do not depend on input but parasitically executed uh, in our program due to some randomness. And it happens pretty often especially if we work with multi-threaded application. 
And our Pfizer actually has a dilemma. What to do with this input? Uh, from one point of view, uh, it can just run it multiple times, run, right, and then reject it uh, if it sees some path uh, appears and disappears uh, after each run. But what if we actually discover something new with this test case? Uh, in this situation, we would reject a new finding. Uh, okay, we can keep test case and raise a warning for our user. Uh, that's what we actually have in AFL. But in this case, uh, if our target is very volatile, we can end up with a very large corpus that uh, actually do not cover anything new at all. So we would just waste in our Pfizer time. Second problem is parallelization. Uh, let's say you have a really slow target and you don't know how or don't know how uh, and don't want to actually spend time on increasing performance uh, of your target, right? So you are not a uh, performance engineer, you are security engineer. So uh, IFL uh, wasn't designed to be parallel uh, from the beginning. Uh, of course there is functionality that allow you to create master and slave instances but uh, let's discuss how it actually works. Let's say we have uh, one master instance and two slaves along with three files in our corpus. Uh, AFL can perform deterministic mutation on master instance and random tweaks on slaves. So the corpus will be copied into each instance and all of the instances will perform mutations uh, in each file one by one. If one slave finds something new, this file will be distributed to other instances and they will continue mutating this, uh, the same finding. So that's all actually what we have in terms of parallelization in AFL. Uh, it will all work fine for fast targets and when you have small corpus, but it will much perform much poorly on slow targets, uh, especially if we have a really large corpus. So there is no easy way to distribute this corpus between instances and ask AFL to share uh, code coverage in a smart way between them. And I believe we can parallelize uh, better here and I'll show how a little bit later. Uh, another problem is the lack of network fuzzing mode in AFL at all. So we actually don't have much fuzzers that can perform uh, network uh, fuzzing, coverage guided network fuzzing uh, at all, especially on Mac. On Linux we can try some uh, AFL forks or Hong Fuzz. Uh, on Windows there is network fuzzing mode uh, implemented by me last year and we can try Hong Fuzz on Mac. That's actually all. Uh, usually when you want to fuzz network application the general advice is to somehow make your application to receive input uh, over file instead of actually doing fuzzing uh, by sending network traffic, right? But it significantly reduce number of potential applications where we can use this approach, uh, especially if we deal with black box binaries when we don't have source code and we can't just modify uh, our target. Speaking about other platforms such as Windows, uh, we are significantly limited in number of uh, potential tools we can use. Uh, basically if we don't have source code, uh, there is WinFL and if we have source code and our target can be compiled with Clang, uh, we can apply libfuzzer which is basically designed to perform fuzzing of uh, library API calls. And that's all. Uh, all of these tools have their own limitation of course. Uh, on ISX we have even less tools uh, that we can use to fuzz user land application. Uh, basically we can try to compile our targets with Clang and use libfuzzer uh, if we have source code. Uh, if not, there is actually nothing that can perform coverage guided fuzzing for you. Well, at least I don't know about this. And of course I am not the first one who wants to address these problems. There are a lot of researchers who try to address uh, these issues and improve AFL in some way such as AFL fast, AFL smart, WinAFL, LibFuzzer, HonkFuzz or and many many other tools. Uh, there are a lot of effort to leverage uh, coverage guided fuzzing on kernel uh, such as sys scholar that demonstrate incredible results uh, along with KFL, Treeforce and others. Uh, I just listed some of projects here uh, and papers uh, published in the last year. So we can dedicate entire day describing different fuzzing solution and techniques. 
And uh, there is a nice paper where you can find a systematic research on all existing Pfizer's if you go if you want to go deeper in this topic. And I apologize if I forget to include some research or tool here. It's not because this tool is not great, it's just because because we have limited amount of space here and of course time. Uh, however, if we summarize all of our requi requirements and problems that I described earlier, we can see there is a huge uh, demand uh, for a new Pfizer here. Uh, this Pfizer should be very flexible in, ter in terms of scalability, parallelization, and platform dependencies. And at the same time, it should be able to address a uh, volatile path problem and be able to support uh, data mutation with uh, multiple Pfizer strategies. Uh, in one Pfizer campaign. Of course, uh, this Pfizer should also support functionalities that already exist in modern Pfizers, such as allowing the user to provide custom mutation algorithm to be able to implement specific Pfizer strategies or even enable a uh, structure aware Pfizer, which is a very, very promising technique uh, today. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce Manu a new coverage guided Pfizer implemented in pure Python that uh, tries to address all of these issues I presented uh, on the previous part of my talk. Uh, Manol was born to be parallel uh, from the beginning. It can obtain coverage from FL instrumented binary or from DBI uh, frameworks like Intel PIN or Dynamario. I'm trying to support Linux, Windows and there is a better version, uh, better version support of uh, for Mac. Uh, I decided to call it Manul after the most fluffiest uh, cat on the planet. Uh, basically, in English it's called uh, Palace Cat, but in Latin it's called uh, Atacalobus Manul. So, Manul is very adaptable cat capable to live and hunt uh, in very severe weather conditions of Central Asia. And I just like this cat. This is actually second DEF CON talk where I present exactly the same slide. And this template was actually made out of this picture. So I process it through neural network and then just apply black color. Okay, moving forward. Let's talk about architecture. Of course, Manol employ model based design. Uh, you have network model, instrumentation, uh, models, uh, core, UI, uh, mutators implemented as plugins. This way, uh, user can ask Manul to enable or disable different mutators or even provide uh, his or her own and ask Manul to use them. Uh, if we uh, want to understand how Manul uh, address volatile path problem, it's pretty straightforward. Let's say we have uh, two volatile paths indicated by yellow. Uh, when Manul sees that our input uh, covers something new in the target, uh, we will run this uh, input a uh, couple of times. Uh, it's called calibration in coverage guided file. And then just uh, if we see some uh, randomness in our coverage, some random path, uh, it will temporarily blacklist uh, those paths and uh, ignore them uh, in the next runs. So first time I found this algorithm in KFL, uh, kernel Pfizer, and I just decided to integrate it with Manu. Probably it was introduced some in some other Pfizer, but I first found it in KFL. Okay. Uh, moving forward, uh, parallel phasing is default feature in Manu. Uh, you just need to specify uh, how many phasing instances you want to spin up using the command line argument. So Manu will automatically start uh, all of them and split the corpus equally uh, to each instance. So in this case, uh, each instance will, ho will have only smart part, uh, small part uh, of the corpus. So we will have only, we, we, this way we can smartly distribute our corpus uh, across instances. And we can even spin up a remote instance on some other machine uh, available over network. So Manu will be able to share corpus and coverage with this remote instance uh, like it's running on the same machine. This way you can like uh, uh, have your own like Pfizer's cluster on top of Manol. And basically each instance is an independent Python process that utilizes its own uh, shared memory. Uh, at the same time, uh, Manol main process uh, will be able to synchronize uh, coverage and share it across uh, other instances to avoid uh, double work for them. So if one instance uh, found some new path uh, in the target, all other instances will at some point uh, know about that and will focus on something else. So in this way we can smartly distribute our uh, Pfizer campaign across uh, all available cores. 
uh, user can easily provide a third party mutator via plugins. Uh, so it's only required to place uh, your plugin in a special folder where manual main binary located and plugins can be implemented in Python and should contain init and mutate functions. Uh, so far I have implemented two fuzzing strategies by default. So you already have it in manual. Uh, the first one is FL strategy uh, ported from C to Python and the second one is uh, Radamsa uh, distributed as uh, native library. Uh, network fuzzing is an experimental feature. So you can try to fuzz TCP or UDP server, it works. And you can ask Manul to act as a TCP or UDP uh, server to, to fast some network client. But this feature in very better stage, so expect problems. And black box binaries uh, fuzzing is a very important part of Manul. So by default, uh, Manul supplied with two DBI clients for Intel PIN and DynamoRio. Uh, Manul will start a binary using one of these uh, frameworks, so you can choose what you want to use, DynamoRio or Intel PIN. Then DynamoRio or PIN launcher will start uh, your target, inject instrumentation library, instrumentation library will open shared memory and will check coverage uh, back to Manul. So pretty straightforward way and I recommend to use DynamoRio because PIN is only supported on Linux and it's low. So this is how it looks when you run it on Windows. Uh, Manul will launch a lot of Python uh, processes. Each of them will run DynamoRio. DynamoRio launcher will run the target and uh, with injected instrumentation library and then the instrumentation library will provide coverage back to uh, Python process. So pretty straightforward. Uh, this is interface. We have information about volatile bytes, coverage, number of iterations, crash, uh, exceptions, and many other useful things. Uh, and it, it also has its own logo implemented as ASCII to art. So just, just to have logo. Each tool should have logo. <laughs> so Manul supports seven most used options via command line and dozens of others that should be provided uh, via configuration. So in this way you can uh, adjust Manul for your own purposes. And let's see it in action. So this is Manul main folder with a lot of files uh, for different platforms. We have the main script here, uh, network module, uh, utils, uh, AFL mutator, printing module, AFL mutator ported from C to Python, Radamsa binary for Linux configuration file. Uh, we can look into code, it's just uh, straightforward Python code, nice and fancy here. I tried to make it as clean as possible to be able uh, people uh, to contribute. So we have uh, also uh, FL ported from uh, C to Python, we see uh, a lot of different uh, strategies uh, from FL. And we, we have a couple of folders. In Windows folder we have uh, folders for DBI and instrumentation libraries for 64 and 32 bits and uh, same for Linux. So you can just uh, uh, launch them and run against black box binaries. And if you look into command line option it's again like uh, any other Pfizer you have to provide a uh, path uh, with your files that you want to submit in your target output, number of parallel Pfizers, uh, switch between dump or smart mode, uh, you can provide path to configuration file with more options and you can restore previous session. So if you look into configuration file we can find much more options. So they should be provided in this file format. So just option name, space, equal value. Uh, we can enable dictionary uh, for AFL uh, strategy. So AFL will inject tokens. And we also can uh, assign weights for AFL, so in Radamsa. For example, we can say that uh, Radamsa should mutate 20% of our test cases and AFL 80%. Or we can enable our own uh, fuzzing strategy uh, just by specifying its name. For example, we can say example mutator should mutate 20% of our test cases. We can run this deterministic seed, uh, we can uh, print uh, more information, we can disable this volatile path uh, suppression algorithm that I showed uh, previously. And to be able to start uh, black box binaries fuzzing you have to specify which DBI framework you want to use. So it's DynamoRio or Intel PIN. Uh, if it's DynamoRio you have to provide DBI root where it's located, uh, the launcher, uh, then client uh, supplied with Manul. And you can also specify for Manul what uh, kind of libraries you want to uh, instrument uh, along with uh, your target binary. So this way you can include them in your code coverage. 
this timeout. Uh, also, this options netconfig master, netconfig slave can be used to uh, spread manual over network. You just need to specify port and IP address. Uh, you can run it uh, in debug mode if you if you need more information. Synchronization between uh, uh, different uh, fuzzing instances, and we have command line fuzzing uh, as an experimental feature. Just uh, in this case, Manu will send it over uh, command line. And to be able to enable network fuzzing, we just need to specify IP and port, uh, for example, and protocol. So, for example, instead of TCP or UDP, we want to fuzz it over TCP. And we can also ignore certain signals, for example, SIGA board, which is quite annoying uh, uh, if uh, it, it, it would be considered as false positive. Okay, we can actually start it. So we just need to say where is my binary, uh, input folder, then provide uh, output folder. In this case, we, we are doing fuzzing against 7 zip, uh, then number of um, parallel threads, like 20 for example, then pass to our main binary, like an AFL, and then uh, command line, like options. And that's all. Then, then just enter. Uh, it will spin up a lot of instances. Uh, each instance will perform its own mutations. Then you can see the dry run is finished. Uh, so it's running. We already identify and uh, and identified a couple of crashes. And there are a lot of uh, other useful information like coverage statistics, performance, executions per second, uh, files in queue, uh, timing, uh, what kind of mode we are running, and strategy. Okay, so. I guess we can stop it and move forward. Now let's discuss uh, vulnerabilities that I managed to find with this tool. So Poplar is an open source library for rendering PDF documents mostly used on Linux. Free software products like Evins, LibreOffice, Inkscape, used by million users uh, across the world integrated this library for PDF documents handling. And Poplar participate in Google OS uh, Fast program, which make it, makes it much harder to identify new vulnerabilities uh, uh, in this target using AFL and LibFizer because Google already generated trillions of test cases. So you, uh, we just don't have uh, enough uh, CPU power. Okay, so I decided to try the same seed corpus with uh, 491 PDF files uh, used by OSS files uh, and run the latest version of AFL and Manul for 24 hours uh, with 78 parallel jobs. As you can see, on average, AFL was approximately 25% faster compared to Manul, but execution speed is not uh, the key factor here. If you compare path uh, found by Manu and the AFL, we can clearly see that after nine hours of running, uh, Manu managed to outperform AFL and continue to discover uh, new paths in the targets uh, faster than AFL. And this was possible because of the improvements uh, that I introduced in the second part of uh, my talk. So our corpus parallelization plus volatile path suppression plus combination of two mutators uh, gave us much better results despite of uh, lower execution speed. And more importantly, uh, Manul managed to discover three uh, zero day vulnerabilities and five non security related bugs in popular, uh, previously of course unknown for developers. So uh, NIST assigned the following CVs for these vulnerabilities from medium to critical severity rate. And let's actually discuss a couple of them. Okay, so the first bug. Uh, the first bug uh, is a heap overflow that exists in downsample row box filter, which is called by downscale image in libcairo library. And this function is actually used to downscale GPX images that might exist in PDF objects. Uh, I don't want to go deeper into technical details here, uh, it's not important. Uh, all we need to know that we can use, uh, uh, we can trigger heap overrun by controlling pixel coverage variable. Uh, I marked is read and force uh, this function to read uh, out of heap chunk to variables a, r, g, and b. And at line 40, we can write these values to the destination buffer. To the best of my knowledge, uh, I don't see straightforward way to exploit it, but uh, most likely we can use this uh, uh, approach, this vulnerability, uh, to get some pointer leak uh, out of this vulnerability. So, which might be very useful uh, if, if you want to bypass SLR. 
Uh, okay, the second bug is located in GPX stream init. Uh, this function doesn't have a check for negative values. So I highlighted in red where popular read uh, booth size, which we can control, and call to unsigned char function without actually checking size of booth size. So in this function, to unsigned chars, uh, initial size can be very large. Uh, so it makes possible to allocate a really large heap chunk uh, of arbitrary size. Uh, we can use this bug as a second stage uh, in house of force uh, heap metadata exploitation, uh, where we need to allocate a large chunk uh, to be able to force malloc return uh, an arbitrary pointer, uh, a pointer to arbitrary place in our in our target memory. Okay, the last bug is bo is more dangerous. Uh, here we control variable i that can be negative which might cause uh, an integer sinus error and hippo out of bound read uh, controlled by an attacker. So if we can satisfy the first condition and avoid this really really huge statement, uh, basically what we can do, we can return an address to an arbitrary object uh, in memory, which is uh, already pretty scary. So the caller function will check uh, if this object is not zero and then uh, call one of its method which is pretty straightforward way to get control over RIP. So I indicated uh, in red uh, this is our function get entry and then we just call entry get flag and uh, instead of get flag we can place a uh, pointer to any place uh, to any function that we want. Uh, the only problem here is to prepare this object in the right way and allocated in the right place. But I believe it's very possible uh so this straightforward to exploit this vulnerability. Okay, uh moving forward. Zeek, uh formerly known as Bro Ideas, uh, it's a world uh, most powerful open source framework um used by thousands of companies and institutions uh, across the planet. Uh there are a lot of very powerful plugins for Zeek such as J3 designed to fingerprint uh, SSL communications uh, which is a very powerful technique to detect suspicious uh, encrypted connections usually performed by malware to communicate with C2 or brain team implant to communicate with C2 depending on who we are talking about. So this project even has its own conference called Brocon uh, which takes place in Arlington every October. So authors of Zeek is very aware of memory corruption issues and fuzzing technique in general. Uh, because even a simple denial of service is completely unacceptable for such type of security products. So the code quality is pretty high, I, I would say very, very high. And they have done multiple fuzzing campaigns uh, in the past. So it was uh, actually a serious challenge for Manu. Uh, unfortunately, Zeek has a very complex initialization routine that usually takes up to 10 seconds to initialize and start uh, traffic monitoring. And it was very, very early stage of Manu that it was like just a couple of Python scripts. So, in this case, uh, if, your ti if your target takes like 10 seconds to initialize, it's completely unacceptable for Pfizer to wait uh, for 10 seconds. Uh, fortunately, they have done a couple of Pfizer campaigns in the past with Leap Pfizer. Uh, so I managed to find an example of how to avoid this long initialization routine. So all we need is to implement a special wrapper for each protocol we want to fuzz and an example of such fuzzer for SSH protocol uh, uh shown on the slide along with other 10 uh, protocols. Uh so I run both fuzzer for 24 hours with uh, 70 parallel instances for each protocol and managed to find three previously unknown vulnerabilities and IFL found zero bugs. Uh, this is the list of vulnerabilities I found. Uh, two of them are located in Kerberos and the last one in IRC protocol implementation. So while for the most application memory leak is not a big deal, uh, for Zeek it might cause a serious issue if memory is not freed uh, in a packet processing function. So memory leak in this case is a memory allocated on the heap but never free. In our case we have memory leak in the function uh, shown on the slide at number right one. Uh, so, so each Kerberos packet will cause Zeek to allocate around 130 kilobytes of memory which will never be free later in the code. And 
we need to send a lot of packets to force Zeke uh, allocate uh, this uh, a lot of memory uh, on the machine and finally cause deny of service. I was able to write a simple exploit uh, which usually takes around 7 8 hours to force Zeke uh, allocate 50 uh, gigabytes of memory leading to crash. But sending a lot of packets is a bit boring right? Uh, what about one packet that can cause a deny of service and stop network traffic analysis? Remember IRC protocol a decade ago it was a very popular way to communicate uh, with people in IRC chats using ICQ. So the protocol is text based and pretty simple. Uh, you have a numerical code uh, for command space and then user string. For example using command 353 uh, which is numerical code for nick then space the name uh, will assign a nickname in IRC chat for you. Uh, but if we send this command without actual nickname, uh, so the function part begins, uh, part begin, uh, will return zero, and then part arrays will be called with this zero, which will finally obviously lead to null pointer the reference and segmentation fault. However, IRC protocol is not enabled by default and we actually need something else. Uh, it's usually uh, up to uh, blue team to enable or disable uh, monitoring of IRC. But the last bug in Kerberos protocol was a bit more complex. So I don't want to go deep into technical details of this problem. I actually uh, don't uh, quite understand it at, at this point <laughs> anyway. But it seems like there is an integer type mismatch in Bitpack generated parser code and Zeek uh, analyzer itself uh, that potentially can cause unintentional pass in some situations to be executed leading to null pointer the reference uh, in the Kerberos protocol parser and usually it happens like 90 percent uh, of the time. So we just need to send uh, our packets three times instead of one. And let's see it in action. So we are on the Linux machine. We have two files. Uh, the first file is a Python script that will connect to Kerberos server and it receives uh, IP port and path to the file with malformed uh, Kerberos uh, packets. Uh, the second file contains actual data, so actual malformed Kerberos packets. And we have a virtual machine with uh, Zeek. And just to make it simpler our Kerberos server script is also placed uh, on, the, on this virtual machine. So in this script we have uh, to specify IP, uh, default Kerberos port which is 88 and file that we want to use for response. So let's actually start it. And uh, I would just uh, need to specify where the script uh, file that we want to answer. Then we can run uh, Zeek itself. It's just uh, we, we have to specify a name, uh, interface that we want to listen on, and this is our IP address. Basically, it's just uh, like local uh, IP address of our virtual machine. But again, this Kerberos server can be placed anywhere in the network. And now we can just uh, run uh, this client. We just need to specify IP address, uh, port, and our uh, packet. So it already sent, and we can see segmentation fault and uh, like stop of network analysis. So this is a pretty straightforward way. Thank you. So this is really pre pretty straightforward way to disable traffic monitoring in the network and uh, then communicate with uh, malware, uh, with C2 uh, or do some red team engagement on top of this finding. And I managed to catch more bugs with Manul in other applications such as an open source uh, tool 7-zip, it's Linux version P7-zip in Honor Hiver for Mac but unfortunately these bugs are still waiting uh, to be patched by maintainer. For, for example for P7-zip last time he was online it was in 2017. I hope he's fine. So again these bugs are waiting to be patched. Uh, I am not going to disclose them today but I will definitely publish a post about this in future when uh, the maintainers will fix it. Uh, two of them allow remote co like code arbitrary code execution. 
Of course, Manul is now in beta stage, right? There are a lot of functionalities that wasn't tested deeply enough, such as anything related to network, uh, any help contributions more than welcome here. Uh, what is very strongly required for now is FL fork server to be able to speed up Manul and perform uh, network fuzzing more efficiently. Uh, I also want to add Intel P trace uh, on Linux and Windows. Uh, I believe that Manul can be even stronger with uh, structure aware fuzzing, so more mutation algorithms again is strongly required. And uh, basically, on macOS, we have a lot of stuff to do. Despite of a lot of future work, uh, Manul already demonstrated that it's a very efficient coverage guided uh, fuzzer that can catch bugs in really tough targets already tested by uh, top security researchers. And I'm going to, I already released uh, like 15 minutes ago, uh, it's already public. Uh, it's released under Apache 2.0 license. So you can already pull it from my GitHub account and find your own zero days with this tool. So you can subscribe to my Twitter account, add me on LinkedIn. If you have any uh, any questions you catch you can catch me later at DEFCON uh, this after the after this talk. Or PM me in Twitter. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>